Okay, so today we will be discussing skin and how it can apply to forensic science. But first, in order to know about this, you have to know all the parts of it. So right now we're going to go over all the different parts of skin. So first we have the epidermis, which is that top layer of skin that you see. And it mainly protects the skin and it's renewed very frequently. It provides a waterproof barrier and creates your skin tone. Next, we have the sepsis glands. And they are microscopic glands in the skin that secrete oil. And it's called sebum, which it, may, it lubricates and waterproofs the skin and also the hair, also protecting you. It's found mostly on the face and scalp. It's not found on the palms and soles. And next we have the papilla. And the papilla is the very bottom portion of the hair that you see. And it is where the blood supply is. So all the capillaries are those red and blue strings that you see. They carry the blood throughout the skin in order to keep it healthy. And lastly, this is the sweat gland. And this serves to obviously release the sweat. And you can see it has a tube up through the skin. And so that allows sweat to get up to the skin. And it secretes on. You can see that. And this sweat ultimately is used to cool you down. So that is that purpose there. So now that we've gone over all the purposes of skin... we can move on to the hair growth stages. Now the hair growth stages, there are three of them. The first one is anagen, as you can see in the first couple of sections here. And this is where the hair is full of life and its growth is constant and regular, as you can see. And also its roots are full with hair and the follicle goes all the way down to the base. There's no room. So this is when hair is at its most healthy state. And so you can see how it starts off small and starts growing bigger and bigger into the root. And then the next stage is, oh, and also the antigen stage lasts two to seven years, depending on hair style and hair type. Moving on to our next stage, catagen. You can see the hair is almost between life and death. It's slowly leaving the root and it's climbing towards the epidermis. So here it loses its volume and its activity suddenly stops. So the hair stops growing because as it's leaving the follicle, it can no longer get those nutrients, so it has stopped growing. And this should last for about two to four months. It'll stay in place for two to four months. Of course, that depends on how much you brush your hair, how much you play with it, because if you do, it can fall out a lot sooner. And then we have telogen, which is the expelling phase. This is where the head is completely dead, but it's still on the head. So it's still dead, but it's slowly being replaced by new hair, which you can see this end phase is also the same as the beginning phase. So this is when the hair is about to leave. And then you finally have hair loss, where the hair is completely gone, and that spot is momentarily bald, and antigen will start, and the whole process will ensue again. Okay, so now we have animal versus human hair. So, some of the differences between them we'll go over. So, the medulla, which is this center part that you can see in the middle of the hair, that thick part. As I was saying, that medulla is the middle section right there. In the animal hair, you can see it almost as a string of dots going down throughout the hair. And in the human hair, you can see that there's no medulla. There is no constant thing going down the hair. So that's one of the main differences between them. And also, in the animal, the medulla will cover most of the length. It's very constant. It's rarely fragmented. Whereas in human hair, if the medulla is even there, it will be extremely fragmented and inconsistent. And also, animal hair will have extremely thick medullas, which can also be seen, whereas in human hair, there usually won't be any. 
Um, there also is a difference between the pigments. You can't see it too well in here, but it's there. So the pigments in animal hair tend to clump, which you can sort of see the some of the clumping by that dotted line almost. Whereas in the human hair, where the pigments are more uniformly distributed, so it's a pretty constant color throughout. Um, and then also human. I mean, animal hair will show distinct banding, which is different sections of hair will differ, dramatic, differ dramatically in color. And so you can almost see that the top part of this, top part of the animal hair is very dark, and then it slowly gets lighter. So you can see the change in color there. Whereas the human hair, the color is fairly constant throughout. There's some dark spots, but not too many. And then also, animal hair, the cuticles will display wide variation in pattern. Whereas you can see in the human hair, they're typically more flat, but that needs to be observed a little bit more closely. It's a little bit harder to see in this picture. Okay, so that's the difference between human and animal hair. The biggest thing to remember is the medullas, how animal hair will usually have a thick one, whereas human hair probably won't have one, and if they do, it'll be extremely fragmented. Okay, so now we're going to go on to ethnic differences. So, in hair, there are three different types, mongoloid, caucasoid, and negroid. So, first, the mongoloid consists of Asian and Native American descents. Caucasoid is European, Middle Eastern, and Latin American. And negroid is African. So, starting with the mongoloid, which is going to be the one, is going to be the East Asian one, the first one you see there. So the medulla is usually unbroken, so you can see on there it's very dark, and it'll run the length of the hair, so they have very thick medullas, and they also have the thickest cuticle and the thickest overall dinero. So overall, their piece of hair is going to be a lot thicker than, say, an African American. And they also have a very round cross-section. And as you can see on here, they have a straighter general shape. So moving on to the Caucasoid, which is going to be that Caucasian one you see there. Um, they're usually oval in shape, which you can see, contrast to the East Asian one, which is very round. So they're oval in shape, and each hair is fairly even in color from the one to the next. And also, Caucasians usually have lighter hair, which you can see in the picture here. And the general shape is a sort of wave, not too curly, just a little bit of a wave. And then Negroid, which is going to be the African-American one, that last one here, they are the finest hairs, and they also have the smallest diameter, which you can see they have the smallest diameter and also that smallest medulla right there. Um, the cross-section is the flattest here, and their pigmentation tends to concentrate in specific areas, so the color varies almost between them. And also they tend to twist more than the other ones, so you can see in the general strand shape, how East Asian is very straight, Caucasian has a wave, then African, African American is a drastic curl. It's very spirally. So those are the main differences. All you need to really remember is that the mongoloid is going to be your biggest strand of hair. Caucasian sort of just in the middle of everything, and then African American is going to be your smallest. Okay, so now just want to go over the differences in hair in different body regions. So first we have head hair, which is going to be the longest. I mean, also that sort of depends on what your haircut is or your hairstyle, but it usually it will definitely grow the longest if you allow it to. And each hair is fairly uniform in diameter. And then facial hair and pubic hair are both very coarse. So that's all you really need to remember about them. And then eyebrows are a little bit stranger because they stand out because they have a very gradual curve to them. And they also have a thicker than normal medulla, so they stand out a little bit. And then arm and leg hairs can be identified by the lack of uniformity in their medullas. And so from each hair to the other one, it's very different. And also, they have milder pigmentation, so that's why arm hair and leg hair doesn't stand out as much as, say, head hair. And also, they have very narrow tips. They're very thin hairs. They're not thick, say, as head hair is. So that's a good thing to remember. 
And then our last thing we want to cover is a case study where trace evidence, in this case hair, was used to actually solve the case. So the case is, um, it's entitled Caught by a Hair, which is quite comical. And what happened was in 1990 in Telluride, Colorado, Ava Schoen was raped and murdered. She was shot in the head, and initially they thought they would have a fantastic lead because the bullet used was very specific, but instead they were unable to come up with any leads, so it ultimately became a cold case. Well, three years later, um, the police received a phone call from a man in Arizona who believed that his brother, Frank Marcus, had been the perpetrator. Well, they tried to hook up his phones and such and get him to confess over the phone, but that didn't turn out well, so they knew they had to find some other evidence against him. So they reopened the case, and they looked into Frank. Well, they were able to trace Frank's movement, and they discovered that he was in Telluride during the murder. He said he was attending a festival, so they figured he was in the proper place at the proper time. So he was further investigated into. And they looked into his record and it ended up that he had a rape record. So this made them very wary of him. So they ended up questioning the man who traveled with him, who refused to give his identity. They questioned him and he said that Frank had tossed two bundles out of the window while they were driving. Well, they tracked down Frank's route and they eventually found the bundles. And in the bundles was clothing. They figured it was either her clothing or his clothing, just something that had to do with the murder. And on the clothing, they were able to discover hair. And so, forensic trace expert Jofus Snyder was able to analyze the color and the structure of the hair, and he determined that it was Ava's showing's hair. So, after this, they pulled Frank in, and they questioned him, and he eventually confessed because he realized they had too much evidence against him. So this just goes to show you how when we know how to identify hair, what are the differences between ethnic groups and all this, you can see who a hair might belong to and solve a crime that way. So that's all we have for hair today. Thank you for listening.